Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is Daniel, a person for such a time as this, part one. Daniel 2. We looked last time. We're going to be getting into Daniel 2 in a minute. Last time in chapter 1, a uh, great story in and of itself. Beautiful uh, illustration of how a person should live under, um, under pressure, uh, under pagan pressure especially. We're living in a culture that's more and more spiraling down into that. How are we supposed to live? Well, Daniel and his friends are a great example of uh, what to do, and uh, they demonstrate by what they do what we should not do. Uh, young men who are victims of their world circumstances, Israel sinned against God, and so uh, God has punished them. Um, uh, they're taken captive, even though Daniel and his friends are teenagers. They're not really responsible for this whole exile thing and this sin that, that's been incurred upon Israel. They really haven't participated in it. It's leadership that's done it. Nonetheless, they're suffering uh, effectively for the sins of others. You ever done that? kind of burns your bacon, doesn't it? So I'm suffering because of something that you did. Well, welcome to the real world. That's the way it is. Uh, it's a bad place. Uh, infants are dying from cancer. Kids are suffering because of maltreatment, human trafficking of, of young people. Why? Because of their sins? No. Because of the sins of the world they were born into. So they were being victimized, these, these young men. Remember, these guys are teenagers when they were over there. We're not, we're not talking about 30-year-olds, 4-year-olds, and we have a bad estimation of teenagers in our culture, and um, in some reasons because it's deserved. But, but we, we, we refuse, or I, said, I should say we neglect to understand that God can do anything through anybody who surrendered to him. And you don't, we, we try, tend to think of ourselves, at least maybe, it's, maybe I'm just talking about myself, I don't know, that I'm an adult, I've got an education, I have a better chance of being used by God. No. None of that stuff means anything to God. What means something to God is a surrendered heart. And I don't care how old you are, surrender to God, God can use you because it's all about him, it's not about you anyway. So anyway, their story is sort of like our story. They're victimized by the iniquity of others. We sort of feel that way. I know I do. Our society's spiraling down, our rights, our livelihood are in jeopardy because of, because of dumb people doing dumb stuff. And it makes me mad, and I know it does you too. Uh, and in many ways, like I said, we're victims of someone else's iniquity. And we can get frustrated, red-faced about it, get all upset, but I promise you it won't do a bit of good. If anything, it will, it will uh, more encourage them to judge us the way that they are. Uh, God has set us here to make a difference. And getting mad and throwing a fit and uh, doing stuff that I see, quote, unquote, Christians doing, uh-uh. That is not God's call for your life. It is not. We need to do what these young men did. They recognized that God was in control. God had sovereignly placed them where they were. God is in sovereign control of the United States of America and the culture of the West that we see degenerating. This is not Satan. Well, it is. God's allowing Satan to do stuff, but God is allowing it. God's, out of, God's not out of control. Like I said, God is ruling the universe with his feet propped up. God is allowing it. So our, our, our society is gener degenerating. Did they deserve it? Yes. No thinking person would, we would have, we would have killed them a long time ago. This culture would have ceased to exist if I was God. But God in his gracious and patience and mercy he is allowing things to spiral down. And we need to accept it. It is what it is, guys. And we need to understand that God is in control. And he sovereignly placed us in the place where we can make a difference. And so these young men recognize the same thing. And thus, the third thing, if, if effectively, is that they refuse to compromise their convictions. So if you look at chapter 2, back up a couple of verses, verse 19, notice what God does for them. He promotes them. So the king talked with them, these, these three friends, four friends, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered into the king's personal service. You're looking at 20, 21-year-old kids. He's moved them into major positions of control over the most powerful country in the world. Would you do that? Right people, you would. If you're smart, like I said, we underestimate what young people are capable of, but God does not. Someone who's surrendered to God can do anything because they will allow God to do anything through their life. Now, could, this could have been the end of the story. This could have been, it, it would have been great all by itself. I mean, these young people facing difficult times in a society that's spiraling down, they, they serve as a testimony to us. But, of course, this was not the end of the story. But I would submit to you for certain, if Daniel 1 had not happened, then there would be no Daniel 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through Daniel 12. Because, like I said, the typical story is... Young people get sent away, they get put under pressure by society, and they capitulate, and we never know anything about them. We would forgive them for that, right? Why? Because we've done the same things. We've compromised. The reason why this is a story is because this guy, these guys did something that we did not do. They refused to compromise. They refused to give in. And God is only now, in Daniel 1, setting them up for a huge impact on a people and a culture and one of the most powerful kings that has ever 
lived, young people. Why? Because they were faithful to God in small things, so God's going to put them in charge of large things. Exactly what Jesus teaches in the New Testament. So Daniel and his friends were God's persons for such a time as they faced, and God used them powerfully. God wants to do the same thing with us. We need to recognize that God has placed us where we are. The reason why you're alive today is because you're not alive some other day. Oh, I wish I could have been back in the 50s, back in the 40s. Well, get over it. You're not going back. This is where you are. It is what it is. Learn to deal with it. Learn to live with it. Learn to like it. Learn to accept it. Learn to say God's in charge. God knows what he's doing. He placed me in this place. How can I help you, Father, in the mission that you have going on around me? That's what these young men did. They became lights. By the way, the best way to see a light is when it's super dark. And so it's getting dark. That's what he wants to do with you. He wants you to shine. Don't become a part of the darkness. Don't become a part of the hate group, you know, and all the stuff that's going on out there. Do not resist the urge. So God had much for Daniel and his friends to do. And, of course, it began with obedience. It began with the unwillingness to compromise. I think George Washington was credited with the saying, few men have the virtue to withstand the highest bidder. Isn't that true? It is. Rare are the ones who can withstand the highest bidder. Oh, I don't give in on the low-level stuff, but man, everybody's got its price. Well, no, not everybody. Not everybody. They're rare indeed, and God has called us to a rare living. He has. Uncompromising people are rare, but God, when he finds them, uses them for rare tasks. Thus, the story of Daniel in particular and his friends. So we're ready to read Daniel chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 1. The problem is we're going to get right into a controversy here that has nothing to do with the story, but we're going to deal with it anyway, just because I think it's a good example, we need, to, we need to handle it. So it says, now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, now that's a problem, and we're going to, anyway, I'll, I'll show you. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, which is the story about what's happening here, and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him, so he's had this massive dream and really upset about it. The problem, as I said here in chapter 2, verse 1, is that it says it's his second year, and we were just told in chapter 3, chapter 1, Back in verse 17 and other back, back in verse 5, I'm sorry, that Daniel and his friends were three years underneath Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 1. And then now it says in chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar has only reigned two years. And they say, ah, controversy, right? Contradiction. There's contradiction in the scripture. I hear people saying that all the time. And let me just give you a word of advice just to begin with uh, without you knowing anything else. All, what you need to know when a person says there's contradiction in the scriptures, you're talking to a person who does not know the Bible. Because I'm telling you, and I don't, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm not, I have every intention to be an expert in the Bible. Every day I intend to be that. But I'm telling you, everything that I've seen that is quote-unquote a contradiction in the Bible, has I, there is a contradiction, and I want to show you where it is. Take your fingers like this. Got them? Got them? Now point them to your ears. In between your two fingers is where the contradiction is. It's not in the Bible. There is not a contradiction in the Bible. There are tons of contradictions out there, but it is between the ears of people who claim. Here's the case. The reason why I just take your time, just because I think it's an example, uh, maybe, a, maybe a fine example of supposed contradictions that are actually not in the scriptures, but are actually between our ears. The contradiction doesn't exist except between the ears of people who don't understand the scriptures. And it, here, here's, here's what's happening. So, so you would see here that in Daniel chapter 1, Chapter 2, verse 1, that Nebuchadnezzar has only reigned for two years, but in Daniel chapter 1, it's already said he's reigned three years. How is that possible? They served him for three years, he's been king for three years, and yet chronologically chapter 2 follows chapter 1, and yet it says he's only served two years, so the writer didn't know what he was talking about, this is a contradiction they say, didn't know what he was talking about, see there's other mistakes and issues in the Bible, and again like I said, only between their ears. What they, if they did a little research, what they would find out is that the Babylonian empire did not reckon years to a king until they had served a full year. In other words, Nabopolizer was... Nebuchadnezzar's, they had some great names, didn't they? Nebuchadnezzar's dad. He passes away some year during his reign, and Nebuchadnezzar takes, all, takes over sometime during that year. Let's say, I don't know when he passed away, but let's say he passed away February 1st, a month into the last year of his reign. So he passes away, and February 1st, he ceases to be king because he gets buried in the ground, and his son becomes king and reigns for the next 11 months. But they don't count that year, Babylonians, as the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. They give the whole year credit to his father, even though he only served one month. That's just the way they reckon things. 
And so it's possible under those circumstances for, for Daniel and his friends to have been underneath the rule of Nebuchadnezzar effectively for three years and yet him only be reckoned with two years. Make sense? So again, where's the controversy? It's in that we're dumb. We don't, know what it, we don't know actually what it says. We don't really understand it. And so thus is the case with most of the contradiction that you find in the scriptures. They're very easily explained if you'll just simply do research. So Nebuchadnezzar, back to what we're doing here, had a dream. And this follows the progression. Look at verse 17, back up to chapter 1. Now, again, put your, put your finger over the word that says chapter 2. Do you notice that there is no, this were not written with chapters. And that, that chapter break can, be, can muddy the waters with us for us sometimes. There's a progression here that God doesn't want us to miss. Look at verse 17. And as for these four use, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom, and it says Daniel in particular, even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. And so four verses later, it says that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. How should you read that? Here we go, right? The problem is, is that we'll end, we'll end our reading and go to bed at night at the end of chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in chapter 2, and we don't realize there's a connection between the two of them. God is sovereignly moving these guys into position. Don't miss the progression. It's important. So Daniel was a person for such a time as this. God had set him up. God was setting up and moving in there. He recognized that God was sovereign. He recognized the fact that God's in control. He did refuse to compromise his life. As a result, God gifts him powerfully. And then God now moves in a, is moving in this chapter in a position where he's going to have tons of say over the entire world. Uh, interestingly enough, how do you and I become people of such, for such a time as this? You have to do the same thing this young man does. Be obedient to God, recognize that he's in control, and trust God that as he gifts you, he's going to use you. As God has gifted you, he plans to use you. You have gifts that God isn't using, uh, you need to talk to him about that. I promise you he doesn't give his, that, they're his gifts. You don't want to squander them. So look at verse 2. He calls in these supposed guys. So he has this dream and he calls in his best guys. The king, it says, gave orders. Call in the magicians and the conjurers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. And so they came in and they stood before the king. He calls in these supposed experts whom he and his father had been consulting. He inherits these guys from his dad. And these are old guys and and uh, these are horoscope writers. Uh, that's where horoscopes came from, by the way, pagan Babylon. So you're participating in paganism when you're reading horoscopes. I hope you know that. If you don't, you need to know that. Uh, by the way, you're not consulting anybody but demons when you consult those things. I hope I'm not offending anyone, but if I do, I guess you're going to have to get over it. So, <laughs> Consulters of the dead, these guys were witch doctors and the like. He brings these guys in. Now, what's happening here is God is about to put the wisdom the collective wisdom of the world on trial, and it's going to fail miserably. He's going to do it through this dream. He's going to, first of all, he's going to lead Nebuchadnezzar and help them understand what's going to be happening in the whole world. By the way, all the way past our day today, the prediction that happens here in Daniel chapter 2, all the way past to the very end, he's going to give them this huge prophecy of what's going to happen. And at the same time, he's going to dethrone all these, all these uh, weirdos and, and uh, nincompoops whom the king of Babylon has been trusting in and his father before him. So let's keep, keep reading verse 3. And the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. And then notice the response. The Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. By the way, from here on, your Bible is not written in the language of the Jews. From here on through chapter 7, Daniel is written in this is the first time you'll find in the Bible until you get to the New Testament that the Bible is written in something other than the language of the people of, of God. Ceases to be Hebrew, turns into Aramaic because this is now the rule of the Gentiles, if you will. So anyway, just a bit of trivia there because I know you needed to know that answer. So there you go. They speak to him in Aramaic and he continues to be Aramaic all the way through chapter 7. O king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. Seems reasonable. Tell us what you saw. Tell us what you heard. What kept you up last night. We will give you the interpretation. Notice how he responds. The king answered the Chaldeans, the command from me is firm. In other words, don't ask me another time about this, because here's what's going to happen. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be, what, fired? No, torn limb from limb. And your houses will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and reward and great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time to the king, let the king tell us the dream. 
tell the dream to his servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king answered and says, I know for certain that you're bargaining for time. Pay attention to that. They're asking for time here, and it doesn't work. And a little bit later, Daniel's going to ask for time, and it does work. And you need to answer the question on why that is true. We're going to do that next time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command for me is firm, verse 9, that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me the interpretation. Now, uh, you have to understand this culture to understand how big a situation this is. First of all, dreams were massively important to the Middle Eastern pagan culture. Massively important. In fact, they kept huge records of dreams especially of the nobility. So for decades and decades, they've been keeping records of different people who've been involved in the courts, kings, uh, queens, uh, 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 officials, governors, all kinds of people. And so what would happen is you would have a dream last night because dreams are so important to them. You would go to one of these guys and he would say, tell me what you dreamed, and you would, he would write it down for you. And then what they would do is, let's say if I'm a person at 21, 20 years, 20 years old, I've had a dream, they would write down the dream and then they would track my life until the day that I died, and then they would, based upon how my life was lived and how it turned out, they would reverse engineer what the dream actually meant. In other words, the, I tell you the dream, they don't know what it means. But once my life is lived and I pass away, they would look back from the time of my death and say, how did his life turn out good, his life turned out bad? And they would say, that, th therefore, that kind of dream means this. Make sense? They kept massive records like this. The top of the page would be John uh, the Chaldean. John the Chaldean dreamed these three dreams when he was in his 30s, and his wife, his wife left him, and his kids uh, took all his money, and uh, he wound up drowning himself in the Euphrates. So therefore, these are bad dreams, okay? And anyone who dreams bad dreams like this, they would say, not necessarily true, that's how his life's going to turn out. And so that's why, they're, that's why they're harping on, tell us your dreams so we can consult the scrolls. And they had piles of these things, sort of, uh, if you will, sort of like in the, um, in the legal world of uh, when, when they go to, to test law, uh, when, when, when something's on trial, they would say, well, how was this law interpreted in the past? They would consult case history. And so based upon the law, how the law was handled, how, how, a, how a judgment was handled in the past, then that will be influential as to how the judge or the jury decides on your case today. They would do the same thing with these books, like I said, based upon just trial and error. And believe me, error is the big thing here. Tell us the dream and we'll consult the books. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was too smart to buy their system, and so he uses this as leverage to get rid of a lot of these old guys. That's what he's going to do. He's upset by the dream. He knows it's not a regular dream. And he apparently is confident that not only does he not know what it is, but none of these knuckleheads know what it is. And so he puts them to the test. And here's his reasoning, by the way. He's a smart guy. So, so let me get this straight, guys. You claim to be able to tell me all kinds of stuff that, ha that are going to happen in the future for me based upon my dream, but you can't tell me what my all, millions of days in advance in the future... But you can't tell me what happened in my bed last night. I'm not buying it. Shouldn't buy it. You can't tell me what, I, what, what is history, one small thing, but yet you claim to be able to tell me all kinds of future stuff. Ah, no, sorry. So off with your heads. They played rough back then. Off with your heads. Uh, what's really going on here, though, is God is moving sovereignly, like I said, to dispel the wisdom of the day and establish his wisdom through these four young men. And that's what's taking place here. Look at verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who could declare the matter for the king. You notice, notice the... So we, we can tell you what the future is, but we can't tell you a single thing about the past. The past is the past, right? 2020 vision is the past. They're incapable of telling you. If they can't tell you what happened yesterday... How can they possibly tell you what's happening tomorrow or the next day? Nebuchadnezzar is a sharp guy. These guys are just nincompoops. He knows it. By the way, it's ticking him off because he and his dad have been listening to them about all the things they've done up to this point. He knows they've been blowing smoke, and now he knows for sure. He knows it. He is mad and upset because this dream has really made him turn him, turn him bad. So anyway, inasmuch as there is no great king or ruler who has ever asked anything like this of the magicians or conjurers or Chaldeans, moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult and there is no one else 
Who could declare it to the king except gods whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh? So in all their paganism, they're right. No one can predict the future. No one can. No one can tell you what actually is going on in someone else's head. No one can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. No one, absolutely no one can. There wasn't a man on earth who could possibly accomplish. So listen, if we think that there's anybody who can really predict the future, guess what? You're wrong. You are wrong, and they are wrong, and they're selling you no different bill of goods than these knuckleheads that are serving Nebuchadnezzar. They're liars. They're deceivers. The horoscopes, the stargazers, all these people, listen, all it is is demonic influence and mind control. That's all that it is. Do not give in to it. That's all it is. So, but, but by the way, there is such a thing, no one can predict the future, but there is such a thing as reading the future. Where do we go to read the future? Every time God speaks of the future, what are you reading? You're reading the actual future. You're reading the actual future. You're going to see in Daniel chapter 2, we're going to get into it more next time. God is going to tell us, I, can tell, I can't tell you all the details between now and, and when this comes, comes, to back, comes to pass, but I can tell you for sure how it's going to end. Daniel chapter 2 tells you exactly how it's going to go. And I would suggest to you, would you rather be on the losing side or the winning side of this? So you need to be on the winning side of this. And, and I guess the simple answer is God is going to win. Make sure you're with God uh, and all that. But we'll get to that next time. We're together. Let's consider, continue to consider what's happening here. So he's super mad. He's super mad because his dream has scared the living daylights out of him. He's super mad. He's super mad because now he realizes that these dinkum poops have been blowing smoke the whole time. To his dad, to him, like I said, most of the time they consulted him. They consulted these guys about different maneuvers, wars, and different things like that. By the way, things that are because this guy is an incredible tactician, he probably pretty much knew intuitively. He realizes, why am I wasting my time with these guys? Everything that I did with them, I could have known by myself, and now I'm paying, by the way, they're all on salary. They're all living large in the kingdom, and he realizes, like I said, they're absolutely, completely worthless. He is mad. So enter, enter the man called Daniel for such a time as this. Look at verse 13. This is a complete setup from God. God creates the crisis, and now God's going to finish the crisis. So the decree went forth, and the wise men, that the wise men should be slain. And by the way, Daniel and his brother, his friends, just became wise men, like last week. And so now all of them are going to be killed, and he has no responsibility. He's just an apprentice wise man at this point. They're 20, 21 years old, maybe. The decree goes forth for Daniel and for his friends to be killed, and so we're going to get into verse 14 and following next time. But you could have not have asked for a better setup. Though all the wise men tell the king, and the king now realizes that there is no human being that can possibly tell him what his dream was, and no human being that can interpret it correctly, and so they're completely set against the human incapability. Inca- Human incapability is completely on display. All of our kingdoms and all of our power and all of our wisdom, by the way, the, 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 I, we talked about it last time, the Babylonians are incredible mathematicians, incredible architecture. They had all kinds of confidence in the stuff that was running around between their ears. And with a very simple dream, God sets it all of being worthless because that's what it was. So what if you know all this stuff? I gave you that capability, but I can immediately pull it back. And that's what he does. He pulls it all back. It's a complete setup from God. And that's exactly where God wants things, the situation to be, so that he can usher in his man of the occasion, Daniel. He has initiated this crisis, and now he's going to bring it to a head. And so we're going to stop right there because, like I said, we're going to get into a whole bunch more stuff next time in this chapter. But I want want us to discuss together. Actually, I'm going to talk, and you're going to listen, right? I want us to discuss together how we can apply this to our lives. God is able, listen to me, God is able to set you up. God is able to set you up. God is able to put you in a place of influence. God is able to do it. God is capable of orchestrating the circumstances and the situations and place you in a place where he can use you. And, but in order for him to do that, you're going to have to follow certain principles that these young men, and Daniel in particular, follow. Number one, here's principle number one. You're going to have to be a person of the book. Daniel and his friends 
are honored by God and moved in positions of influence because they were young men who followed the book. When they were put into circumstances to decide either follow God or follow the way of the king and the most powerful people in the world, who did they follow? God. How did they know to do that? Because they knew what the book said. And by the way, where were they reading that? Did they have their pocket scrolls with them? You know, they've been, they've been exiled now for four years or so. They brought their little pocket roll, scrolls with them. You know, it was in their pocket over there. They whipped out and said, what, what should we do with this food? Should we eat or should we not? It says in the scrolls, this and such. Did they pull out their phone? <laughs> they had a Bible. You know, scroll down through the Hebrew text. It says right there that we shouldn't do this. So, guys, we've got to do this. No, they don't have it. They've been removed from their culture. They've been removed from their people. They've been removed from their temple. They were removed from everything. And so now, now, what, what are they consulting? Where are they getting their Bible from? Where's their Bible? Point back to your ears. It's betraying their upbringing, is it not? They were raised well. They're never going to see another Torah scroll. They're never going to see the temple again. So the only reference they have is the Bible that they have in their heads. They were raised well, and now they're living according to the Bible. Now they're doing it. Now they're, now, now they're following it. So, so Bible study is incredible. How do we know they were Bible study people? Because they, they, here they are referencing it, but it's between their ears. They don't have the book. So, so the second thing they do, so first of all, Bible study. Secondly, we have prayer. Right after this, we're not going to read it. Right after this, Daniel calls his friends, and they call a prayer meeting together, demonstrating that that's the way they handle crisis. These young men, when they were put under crisis, they learned the hard way or the easy way, I don't know which. That, that when a crisis comes, we pray together. So Daniel, in the rest of the chapter, calls a prayer meeting of his friends and himself. He says, pray for us that God will give us the interpretation because literally their life's on the line. If, if he does not get an interpretation, he, along with all the quote-unquote wise men, are going to be completely dead. So number one, they do Bible study. Number two, they do prayer. Number three, as we've talked about already, they acknowledge God's sovereignty in whatever situation they were in. God has placed me here. It may not be a place I want to be. May not be the place where I thought I would be at 21 or whatever. I thought I was going to be hanging out in Jerusalem with all my buddies and dating a girl. But here I am. It's not what I want. But that's where God has me. So, bloom where you're planted. Light a candle in the darkness. That's what they do. And then a fourth thing. They're obedient and faithful to God despite the pressure. We said we've already talked about that. And so now God is propelling them. God is sending them to a place of influence. And again, these seem like small things, and they are. Who knows whether you study your Bible or not? You shake your head when the preacher says, you need to go home and study your Bible. Yes, sir, we're going to do that. Well, I don't come check on you. I'm not going to. Who knows whether you pray or not? Who, who knows whether you recognize that God is sovereign and that he has placed you in that place or, or whether you're obedient to God? I'm not following you around. No one else is. Who knows? God does. The stuff that no one else sees that no one else knows about you, these quote-unquote small things that don't seemingly matter are the only things that God is checking on to move you to any place of influence. Because I'm telling you, why, if he's given, why would he give you a large assignment when you're not doing the small ones? Makes sense, doesn't it? God, I want to do something great for you. Yeah, but I've told you you need to be in church regularly and you need to be studying the scriptures and you need to be involved in one-on-one -on -one Bible study. And you need to be growing, you need to be spending time with me. Well, I don't have time for that. Well, I don't have time to use a person like that then. He does, would you? So you're an employer and you've got employees who don't do the things you tell them to do and they come to you and ask for a raise? No. No. Fired. Demoted. But you're not getting new stuff and you're not getting more stuff and you're not getting more money. And yet we want God to, God, I, I just want to be a person of influence. I want to make a difference in the world around me. And, and, um, and you're not doing the small things, assignments he's given to you. You shouldn't expect that to happen. There are no big assignments for those who won't do the small ones. You want to be a person of influence? Believe me, God wants you to be that. God wants you to move, move you to a place where you can light up the world that you're living. We're dark, getting darker and darker all the time. And the lights refuse to shine? Come on. Come on, why are you here? That's a good question. So I refuse to shine, so why should God leave you here? Look, maybe he should just take you on to heaven. Maybe we should ask him to do that. God, we pray today that all the people who refuse to shine, that you would just take them to heaven this afternoon as they drive across the bridge. Is that what you want me to do? Huh? Have a conversation with God about that. What's your purpose here? What's our purpose?
I want to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes and me consider the things that we've learned today. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you choose to use us. God, you do see us. You do know who we really are, not who we propose to be at church or in front of anyone else, not even who we think we are. You know who we really are when we're all by ourselves, when we have an opportunity to pray or read the scriptures, or when we don't take that opportunity, when when we have an opportunity to choose right, and either we choose it or we don't, when we have an opportunity to recognize that you've placed us where we are and and, um, or not. So, Father, I pray that when you look deep inside of us who we really are, that you would see something that you can use something that's obedient to you, Lord, that we would live for your eyes and not worry about the eyes of anyone else, not worry about the place or the position or any assignment you may give to us. Instead, be worried about the assignments you've already given to us, being faithful to you. Again, we thank you for these young men and for Daniel who stood strong and who were ready. God, we acknowledge that you are in control of history and uh, that you're in control of kings and presidents and prime ministers and countries and You are sovereign over all these things. So God, as we sit underneath your sovereignty, I ask God that we would be determined to be useful to you. Thank you so much, God, for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.